Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, please turn off your yeah, iPhones like or, or switch like them to like silent mode. Uh, we're very uh, pleased to host this morning Ambassador uh, Gidon Meir, who in his last uh, position in the Foreign Ministry was Director General for Public Policy and before served in the a distinguished career. They all received your CV, so I'm okay. skipping the, uh, uh, most of it. Um, but he served in the in Canada. He was the director of training division at the Ministry uh, Training Diplomats. Uh, he was director of academic program for the Rothschild uh, Foundation. Deputy head of mission, the Israeli Embassy in London and the uh, Charge d'Affaires in uh, Dublin, uh, advisor to Minister for Foreign Affairs or World Jewish Affairs uh, and, and more. And since retiring in 2013, I uh, was elected as a city council member of Nevaser uh, Zion. Now you're struggling with the, with the new road there. Well, uh, oh, I have a question on that. <laughs> <laughs> While most of us couldn't care less, but uh, these people probably... Uh, yeah, but we gather today to speak about other things, uh, mainly about the implications of the uh, Paris conference, but since you're here and knowing our uh, crowd, you probably get uh, questions concerning other issues as well. Uh, so, get on with the, uh, we're very pleased to host you, please. Thank you, Uri. <coughs> Thank you, Uri. You didn't say for how many years we know each other. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll be delighted to talk about Nevaseret. I can tell you only one thing. Local politics is not less dirty than, uh, than uh, <laughs> national <laughs> politics. Uh, and once you are in, once you are in, it's very, chal it's very challenging. Uh, <clears throat> what I will do, first of all, I'm representing nobody. I'm representing my wife and myself <clears throat> and, our op and my opinions. So, uh, and the way I see it since retiring from the foreign ministry with all the, uh, with all the, uh, the experience which I got uh, through the 45 years of my, uh, of my uh, serving the country in the, in the MFA. What I would like to do is to, uh, to do some observations about the Paris conference and actually what happened since I cannot be a prophet, but I will tell you one thing. I will start with this. I see that the Israeli right is looking for Trump for the, this Friday. As in Hebrew we say, Mashiach ben David is coming. The Messiah is coming. Friday the big change will take place. This reminds me another episode, which was in the year 2000. There was a conversation between Yasser Arafat and Mubarak on the Clinton, on the Clinton uh, uh, outline. And Mubarak urged Arafat to accept the outline. And, our, and this was the Israeli intelligence or the American uh, uh, intelligence uh, intercepted this conversation. <coughs> and uh, Arafat uh, uh, said to Mubarak, uh -uh, in three weeks' time, there's going to be a new president, a new administration, the Bush administration, and everything is going to change. The rest is history. So whoever is looking for big changes has to hold his breath for the time being. We don't know what's going to be. Uh, let me just. It's the Mossad, you know. No, it's not the Mossad. It's another council member. I told you it's politics. Oh, oh, oh. It's politics. <laughs> politics. <laughs> it's politics. Um, and uh, and uh, the same thing is only with different players is taking place right now. No one knows what's going to be on Friday. We don't know if the embassy will move to Jerusalem. We know we are going to deal with a new president with a business-like uh, with a business-like uh, uh, view of the world. He can't move for six months. Uh, he just signed. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, he just signed again uh, for six months. Uh, Walter, let let's now. 
about my observations about the Paris conference. First of all, it's not new. The French always are pushing for, interne for internaliz internalization of the conflict. It's, there's nothing new under the sun. This time, they have also an internal reason. They, they know from us. You know, Kissinger said, you always said Israel doesn't have a foreign policy, we have only a domestic policy. Hollande has the same. There are elections. He needed this, not for himself, because he's not running, but for the left in, in, in France, this conference was very important. The timing. I think it was the worst time of a conference like this to take place. A, the Western world is standing in front of a change, a big change. We just mentioned an administration change in America. Who participated in the meeting? Kerry, who is the old, the old news. Friday, it's going to be a change, we don't know what, but it's definitely not going to be the Obama foreign policy. There are going to be elections in Germany in September. There are going to be elections in France. Europe is going to change. Britain is already changing its foreign policy. So the timing from this point of view was a very bad timing. The EU has huge challenges in front of it. Immigration, terrorism, economic, Brexit. This is what is so important right now at this point of time to deal with the Arab-Israeli conflict, with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I wonder. Also in Israel something is happening right now. There's an earthquake taking place here. It's a question of time. But this administration here right now is in a, in a, in a, tra in a traffic light. We don't know what's going to happen here in the next two, three, four months. So also decision-making in Israel is very difficult and we can talk about it. The next point, the Arab world is in a chaotic situation since the Arab, uh, since the Arab uh, Spring. New changes in the Arab world. Interests are changing. A new administration in Egypt which seems to be much more pro-Israel than pro-Palestinian. Pro Definitely not pro-Hamas. So from the timing point of view, in my view, worse timing. It's a declarative, a declarative conference which will bring nothing. And we will talk about it later. Let's say something about the settlements, because this was a major issue, and this was also the issue of the decision of the 2334 of the, of the Security Council. As much as I am as I'm critical about the, the, the settlement policy of this government, and governments before, whether they are right or left, the for 45 years you were against it? For, for, it's not a question of 45 years. First of all, the settlement started... Actually, thinking. it's 45, I know. Let's take, first of all, the policy of the right on settlements. <coughs> Since Begin came to power. When he came to power, I think it was two, three, four years later, 81, Gula, Gula Cohen put a lot of pressure on, B, on Begin to, uh, to pass the law of Jerusalem. So, Begin passed the law of Jerusalem to declare that Jerusalem is the eternal capital of the state of Israel. Do we need such a declaration? Don't we know that Jerusalem is the capital of the state of Israel? Did it make any political change? On the contrary, 13 European embassies who were in Jerusalem, including Belgium, Holland, moved to Tel Aviv. As far as I remember, the American embassy was never, never, ever in Jerusalem. There was only European and South American and some South American uh, embassies. There are always declarative positions of the right. It started, as I said, with begging, and then it starts all over right-wing governments in Israel. It's because of Kissinger, because they need strong statements for the power base. 
So it started with Jerusalem, then it continued with E1. Remember E1? E1, the area between Jerusalem and Malay Domin. Various prime ministers, various foreign ministers declared we have to build in, Mal in, in E1 in order to create a contingency between Jerusalem and Malay Domin. Was there built one building there? Not even one, except police. a police station. This is the only thing. Did Israel pay the price for these declarations? Absolutely, yes. Now I will tell you an episode. After the United Nations General Assembly passed the resolution, NMS, non-member state, there is a Pavlovian reaction of Israel, what, they, what some of the right call the, the, the right Zionist answer. We build. So first of all, we build in declaration. We don't build on the ground. Yvette Lieberman was a foreign minister. I was a member of the, of the executive of the foreign ministry. And I went to Yvette at the, in a meeting. Avigdo. Avigdo. Avigdo Lieberman. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I had a very good relation with him. I, I, I like to work with the man as much as he's sometimes controversial, but from my point of view, he was one of my best foreign ministers from the point of view of implementing policies and making and, and decision making. He is really strong on making decisions. And I told him, look, if you want to build in E1 because it's an ideology of your party, of yourself, of the government, we can defend it, no problem. If you want to build there in order to punish the Palestinians, this is undefendable. And Ran Kuriel, who was my partner, and please don't, I can mention myself, I don't want, I'm just mentioning it here off the record, the other name, said to Lieberman the same. This is a red flag for Europe. This is a red flag even for the United States of America. Don't do it. He asked me what to do, and I told him, you know what? Make a press brief, a brief to the Israeli press and tell them your opinion. And this is exactly what he did. And one of the senior Israeli Israeli correspondents, I remember, Udi Segal, came to me after the meeting and asked me, what happened to your boss? Did he change his mind? But this, is, this was good for the time, and he understood what real politics means. Since then, there were various other declarations by various Israeli governments to build in E1. Until now, even this government which is one of the most right-wing governments in Israel, did not make a decision to build there. Declarations, yes. And we pay for the declarations. How many of us remember that when President Obama started his tenure, there was a decision to freeze settlements for 10 months? And there was a freeze. What did the international community do with this? It was Bibi Netanyahu, I have to, tell, to say to his credit, who freeze the settlements. What happened? What did the international community do? Zero. Then they asked him, Obama asked him for another three months. In my view, it was a mistake not to agree. A mistake from the point of view of public diplomacy. Of the blaming, of the bla what we call the blaming, the, uh, the blaming game. But if he would have accepted it, BB, nothing would have happened never, nevertheless. And this was his mistake. Because then you can tell the international community we did everything we can or we could in order to bring peace. So as much as I'm critical about the, and I want to say another sentence, left-wing governments in Israel, center-left, Ormad, Barak, uh, uh, Rabin, built like crazy in the settlements. And they were not criticized by this government because they were engaged in a process and therefore, the international community had what they have to do is to give some statements, but the building continued. Here we have a government which is very strong in statements, and especially for their political base. Now I can say the next sentence. I think it is wrong to put the settlements as an equalization to terror. As in to, to, to equal or to, uh, to, uh, to say that to put it on the same, to on give the, the same, same, the same, same, the same level same. settlements and terrorism. Nothing to be compared. 
because settlements are a political, a political issue. Yes, they are done today also in order to prevent a future Palestinian, Palestinian, uh, Palestinian uh, state. But they don't kill people. They kill aspirations. They kill political moves. So when the international community is putting settlements on the same level as terror, it's a big mistake. It's a mistake also because it doesn't speak to the Israeli public opinion. If any country, or the, I would say the international community, wants to deal only with settlements, they have to do it only if they don't link it to terror or to BDS. Now I want to say one word about BDS. Some of you know me, the family where I come from. My grandfather established in 1908 the first, the first bookstore here in Jerusalem, a bookstore which exists until this very day. It's called Ludwig Meyer. In 1914 he was called by the... By the, uh, by the uh, by the no, by the Turks, by the Germans to come back for First World War. He was a translator from Germany to English, English German. And he reopened the books. So he he put all the books here. He stored them in the Anglo-Palestine Bank, which is today Bank Lumili Israel. Went back to Berlin, reopened the bookstore on Luther Lutherstrasse in Berlin. And on April first. 1933, which was a Shabbat, if I'm not mistaken, it was a Saturday Shabbat of Passover. He came back from the main synagogue in Berlin, and on the bookstore there was a sign, Juden nicht kaufen. And when he came home, there was a sign on the door, on the house, Juden raus, Jews out. This was the moment where he decided that he's taking his two children, my father and my uncle, and he's coming back because he had the certificate, he came back to Eretz Israel, to the land of Israel. Why do I mention it? Because April 1st, 1933, was the first boycott of Jewish businesses, declared by Hitler. And I don't see a big change on the calls to boycott businesses today and what happened in 1933. From my point of view, as a Jew, as somebody whose father came to this country, I cannot tolerate it. Why do I say it? Because I have a lot of criticism on the settlements. But it has nothing to do with boycotting. You want to deal with settlements? You can deal with them. Is the Israeli policy right? No. Do I have criticism on Prime Minister Netanyahu on the, criticism, on, on the settlements? The answer is definitely yes. And I have family in the settlements. I have a brother who lives in the settlements. Where? Beit El. Oh. With seven children, Beli Aymara, 30 grandchildren. <laughs> Look, we have a great family. I just this Saturday celebrated my 70th birthday with a big Shabbat dinner with my family. Oh, Everyone, oh, right, oh, left, oh, Hiloni, oh, Dati. I have in my family, in my tent, I have everything, all the gaps in the Israeli society I have in my, in my, in my, in my tent. All the gaps, and it except Arabs and Jews. But otherwise, I have everything. We have very good relation. You know why? Because there are two issues we don't talk about. Religion and, and politics. <laughs> so what is left? Exactly. Listen, there's, a lot, there's a lot of gossip about the family to talk about. <laughs> okay, so I am very critical on the settlement policy of the Israeli government. I don't think Israel has a foreign policy. Every, every decision which is made here is being made by, toward the right-wing base. And there's also no ideology. <coughs> Look, I had a foreign minister. He was also prime minister in this country. His name was Yitzhak Shamir. Yitzhak Shamir was a very right-wing prime minister, a very right-wing foreign minister. He had an ideology. You can agree or disagree. But the man had an ideology and he had a foreign policy. When he, won, when he went to a debate with Bush senior, he did it in a style. 
Yes, there was a decision of the American administration later on to uh, to to uh, to, uh, to to hold the, 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 the ten billion the ten billion dollars ten billion loan guarantees for the for the Aliyah for the for the immigration. But he had an ideology. His ideology was not to survive as a prime minister. His ideology was his love and commitment to the Jewish state. I respected the man for his ideology. I will tell you something. I also respect Bennett. Because Bennett has an ideology. You can like or dislike his ideology. But the man works for an ideology. He loves Israel. He believes that his ideology will survive the Jewish people. I beg to differ, but it doesn't matter. He has an ideology. I respect him for the fact that he comes with a policy. I also respect what his minister, Ayala Chaked, is saying. We were elected. We have the power. It's a democracy. And the majority of the people gave the, this coalition not to the Likud. This, the majority of the people of Israel gave this coalition the majority. And if you have a majority, and you have an ideology, ask Professor Yeches Kedro, who is one of my mentors, who will say to you, when there is a, a, a party which, which wins an election, it has a right to implement its policy. On this, I have no argument. I can debate it. I will debate it. You never have enough time. Now, as you see, I have criticism within the family. And in every family, when you criticize your parents, your brothers, your children, your grandchildren, <coughs> no matter what, or vice versa, you want to do it within the family. You don't want anyone out of the family to come to criticize you and to give you advice. The Paris conference is an event outside the family. It will alienate many Israelis to support a policy which they want to implement in Israel. It's our, it's our job to decide by election. On election day, we go and we vote. I don't believe that neither the Palestinians nor the Israelis will make peace because the international community is putting pressure. And with whom will we make peace? With Hamas? With, uh, with, uh, with Abu Mazen, who is in power, what, for 10, over, 10, over 10 years now? 13, 12. 12, no election? Tom Friedman one, one wrote an article uh, 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 where he said there was never a war between, uh, uh, between two states where there are McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, he made a whole book about this, which is... Uh, golden Arch of Fear. Hmm? The Golden Arch of Fear. How is it called? The Golden Arch of Fear. Ah, okay. Ah, the Golden Arch, okay. <laughs> now... If the international community wants to change public opinion in Israel and to bring a change in in the in the, in, 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 in a government in not policy in a government, they have to wait to work the way you work in the, in a democracy, but you don't impose. I don't believe in imposed settlement in this part of the world. Does Bibi want a two-state solution? Maybe deep inside he wants, but he is not able to implement it because he's looking, as I said before, to the right, to the right of Bennett. I always go back to Kissinger. This is Israel's foreign policy, domestic policy. And therefore, even if he wants it, he will never do it. Because this kind of coalition will not allow him to go to a Palestinian state. Do the Palestinians want a two-state solution? I doubt it. Today, the two extreme sides, according to what I see, in Israel and on the Palestinian side, are looking for a one-state solution. Each one for his own reasons. In any case, a one-state solution is the end of the Jewish people, at the end of the Jewish state. No matter how we look into it. So from my point of view, the only solution will be a two-state solution. Can the international community impose it? The answer is no. Does anyone have the power to impose it? I don't think so, even not the United States of America, and especially not with this administration. This means... The new, the new one, the new one. If there was a chance to do it, 
the Paris conference. If they would have done the Paris conference eight years ago, seven years ago, at the beginning of the Obama administration, from the declarative, declarative point of view, it might have worked. I'm not sure, but, but they did nothing for eight years. So what, Kerry is coming now two days before he's leaving office, he's coming to a conference like this. Now I want to say a few words about how the EU works and how the international community works. Okay. I can stop here and do questions and answers. No, no. Talk mm. about the EU. Let's no, no, hear. We need to know how the EU works. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but this I'm telling you from my experience. When it comes to the relationship between Israel and the EU, there are two levels. There's a bilateral level, Israel vis-a-vis -vis each one of the countries, and there is there the EU vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Not necessarily the policies the bilateral policies and the policies within the EU are the same. You might big, you find big gaps between the policies. Why? Because for many governments, it's not true for the new British government, by the way, and not for the Cameron government, but for former British. I was also number two in, in London, so I know the British, uh, the British, uh, the British uh, Foreign Office and all the systems there. I have open brackets. I have a PowerPoint presentation about Israel and Europe, and about what's happening in Europe today. And my last picture is, and especially to Israeli audiences, and my last picture there is a picture when David Cameron leaves 10 Downing Street with his wife and the children. Then I bring up the next picture, which is a picture of Theresa May curtsy in front of the Queen, receiving receiving the, uh, the, uh, premiership. The, the, the premiership from the Queen. And then comes up the last picture of David Cameron with jeans and t-shirt taking all the boxes from the moving, uh, from the moving uh, truck to his home. And I say, and people laugh, because I always compare how democracy works in the UK and how democracy <coughs> works in this country. So coming back, we always had a problem when it came to the EU to deal with the governments because when they come there to Brussels or to Strasbourg, they behave differently than the way they behave with us. Why is it? Because for the EU, even before the Lisbon, the Lisbon uh, Treaty, for the EU it was always very easy to come to the lowest common denominator on a foreign policy, which was the Middle East. They couldn't agree on anything. It's like the Paris conference now. There are problems in Syria, there are problems in the rest of the Arab world, there are problems all over Ukraine. The only issue where they can come together is the Middle East. I don't want to say Israel, I will say the Middle, I will say the Middle East. And we were always struggling on the policies within the EU than on the policies which had to deal directly bilateral between us and the different countries. It was true also in Italy. And it was true also during Berlusconi's, uh, Berlusconi's uh, premiership, when Berlusconi was one of Israel's best friends in Europe. Even though Berlusconi wanted Israel to be a member of the European, of the European Union, which Israel will never do. Not only the European will not do it, it's also not an Israeli interest to be a member of the European. We have an interest to have the benefits and the agreements, but not to be a member of, of of the European of the European Union. Okay, I will stop here. Okay, we'll stop here, and uh, I'm sure yes, well, please. That last comment made me think straight away to the Arab League, that the one common denominator is against Israel. Can you expand on the difference in the EU and the Arab Leagues? Two different organizations. Two different because the EU organizations. because the EU is a democratic. It's it's based on, on <laughs> democracies. The Arab League is not based on democracies. I can see on the Arab League a positive side on the, when it comes to the question of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Because I can see that the, the Saudi, uh, the Arab League uh, initiative is a positive way. And even one of Israel's top leaders today sees the same way, it's, it's uh, Avigdor Lieberman. That we have to uh, reach an agreement with the Arab world, not only with the Palestinians. And therefore the Arab League can play here a positive, Look, we don't like every note and every declaration in the Saudi uh, 
in the Saudi Arab League uh, initiative, but it's a it's a it's a starter for to negotiate on something very comprehensive. But it's been on the table for 15 years. Yeah, now. But now there's but now everyone because of Iran because what's happening in the region. Now they say oh we want this yeah. because there's also change of interest in I said there in the beginning that changes in the Arab world too. Yes, please. Two questions. Uh, Theresa May, first of all, the UK voted for the anti-Israel, anti-settlement resolution. Then all of a sudden they switched. Was that because of Trump's leverage that they, he would help with Brexit, he would help with trade? That's my first question. Let's take one, one at a time. First of all, you described the, the, the resolution as an anti-Israel. I don't see it as an anti, I don't see the resolution as an anti-Israel resolution. Okay? From my point of view, there are some also positive elements, even though it brings me back what I said before. If the international community would have dealt only with the problem of settlements on one side, and problems of, of, of the, that you have on the uh, uh, Palestinian side, terrorism and other things, in a different, on different levels, this would have been fine with me. The fact that there was there a paragraph on Jerusalem made the whole, the whole, uh, the whole resolution as being seen as anti-Israel. But 40 members voted for. Don't forget, the United States didn't vote for. The United States abstained. Britain, France, there were some, our best, of, our best friends were there voting on this. Maybe the reason was that Israel is putting a red flag always in front of the international community every time that Biden is coming here, we have a new, a new build. Like what I said before, declarative, declarative policies of the government on Israel on settlements. So what's the positive side of the... Of the, the only uh, set, if, if, if it would have been only the settlements, it would have been positive because we have to understand that the international community is not tolerating building more settlements. And if we were really sincere in, in what BB is saying, a two-state solution, we stop a little bit the settlements, we freeze the settlements, we build only the necessity for, for, for natural, uh, natural, natural growth. But we are, as I said before, NMS, remember, not member state. We immediately give an answer. I'll tell you even more. I spoke about it with some of the leaders of the settlement movement. They believe this, it, it hurts their, their, their policies and their wishes. Jerusalem. There's a, uh, there's a terror attack, non-member state. The declaration immediately we will be in Har Choma, Gilo, and uh, Ramot. What is actually the statement saying of the Israeli government? We Israelis, we say that Ramot, Gilo, and, uh, and Har Choma are settlements. We don't say we build in Jerusalem. We build in Har Choma. It's our, it's our admis ad 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 admission that Har Choma is a settlement. Because the right wing governments live on declarations, on statements, and not on deeds. If you want to build, build. Be engaged in a, in a, in a, in a, in a post process and do what other prime ministers did. How do you explain Britain? Second. No, I, on the first, how do you explain Britain? The change. My only answer is that it might have been that the foreign ministry, the, the, the foreign office, was behind it. But this is a very weak explanation because the foreign, the foreign minister, uh, Boris Johnson, is a great friend of the state of Israel. So maybe something went wrong. Or it was a total, a total, uh, a total, uh, uh, um, um, coordination. coordination with the American administration, not with the Trump administration, with the, with, with the Obama, with the Obama, with the Obama administration. Mm. I have no other, I have no other, I have no other explanation. And also, it's an old policy of Britain. The set, listen, settlements is not a new policy of the international community. <coughs> it's an old policy. The international community from Britain, France, Germany, Germany, one of our best friends, is that the settlements are illegal. What makes me angry, usually, as an Israeli, is that they put the settlement as the, the root cause of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the of the conflict. And it's absolutely not the root. This is a big success of the Palestinian public diplomacy. No doubt about it. 
when it comes to the front of public diplomacy, we are losing constantly. With all your efforts? With all my efforts, with everything. I, but I, believe me, I'm not saying it only today because I'm out. I used to say it also when I was inside. When I was inside, the government of governments of Israel don't see public diplomacy as part of Israel's national security. Okay, follow-up question. How could you, on a city council in Mevizera, be asleep so that now we're going to have the cutoff of our, of our exit and entrance into the city? We heard that all the diplomats fell asleep during this time. Very, more passionately about, <laughs> than about UK. <laughs> you what are you doing? Okay. But should I answer it? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> briefly, briefly. Briefly. First of all, you have to take into consideration that I fell asleep. I didn't fall asleep. I have a mayor, a, a, a mayor which is, again, it's, it's the same pattern of governing in Israel. It starts from the prime minister down to the mayors. He has a political interest in the Likud. He's a Likud member. He and Israel Katz, the, the minister of, uh, of uh, transportation. transportation, are same members of the Likud Central Committee. They have a post. He wants him to support him. He wants to have. He wants to go to politics, mm -hmm. and therefore, thirty thousand inhabitants of Mevaser Zion are going to pay a huge price from Friday morning. Mm -hmm. This is what's going to happen. And by the way, I'm afraid that it's not only the inhabitants of Mevaser are going to pay the price because the uh, the traffic jams are going to go also to those who are going from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, vice versa. Mevaser is going to have only one entrance from Tel Aviv and from Jerusalem with one uh, traffic you light. You mentioned Friday morning, maybe Trump will uh, take care of it. Yeah, <laughs> sure, okay, uh, uh, Walter. Uh, you, you're, very, you're very strong on the two-state solution, but uh, I, I hope you agree with me that it's not, uh, two-state solution is not just giving land, uh, it has a, an existential dimension for Israel. And I want to put to you the same question that I put to a previous speaker uh, in, in the, to, to safeguard the, the existential uh, dimension of a two-state solution, we say this has to be demilitarized. How long, is my question, how long do you think uh, demilitarizing, if the state, let us assume there is a state, and we've made all the uh, arrangements, and now it's demilitarized. How long do you think such a state would remain demilitarized. Okay. I give you the example of uh, uh, the Rheinland. From my point of view, since since we are not in Europe, it's not Benelux here. Sorry, it's not Benelux. <coughs> we know our neighbors. We are in a tough neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> we are we are in a tough neighborhood. From my point of view, forever, forever. Because if you want to live in peace, why do you need a, why do why do you need a, a military? No, but how can you guarantee? How, how can I guarantee? This is what I'm saying. It has to be. It will be guaranteed. It will has to can be guaranteed only by Israel. I don't believe in the international community. We had already an we had already an exercise like this in the Gaza, in the Gaza, in the Gaza, in the Gaza Strip with the international community. With the uh, I don't remember the name of the force. Ubam, Ubam, Ubam. Ubam Rafa. Excuse me. Ubam Rafa. We had an experience like this in the Six Day War. In the Six Day War, when the when the, when the United Nations took Utah. away it, hmm? Utah. You, 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 it was Utah. I don't remember. It was Utah. Yeah. Or, 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 no, no matter. But we have an experience, so it has to be guaranteed by us. Okay. So I must follow this up. Please if do. that is so, it, supposing the Palestinian state would uh, not uh, abide by it after some time and would invite uh, 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 other uh, people in from outside that, that would be dangerous. Uh, would, you, would you say that we should use military force then in order to prevent that and go into a, 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 a sovereign state? Yes. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know, sorry. The answer. The answer. The answer. Sorry, the answer. No, I agree with Uri. The answer. No, I is here. The answer. Listen, we come from the same, almost the same school of thought. It's the answer. The answer is yes, absolutely yes. This is the reason I said we have to guarantee it. Now, the question is, are they coming with clean hands? I feel very strong to talk about the two-state solution. 
I think it will be the, to the benefit of the Palestinians and to the benefit of Israel. The question is not whether we want it. The question is whether they want it. You know, it reminds me of the story about the two hunters, the Jewish hunters, who went to a safari in Kenya. And uh, suddenly a, a, a hurdle of rhinoceros is coming in front of them. So one is telling to his friend, Moshe, let's run away, run away. He said, why? Because of men, they're going to eat us. He said, don't you know that rhinoceros are vegetarian? He said, you know it and I know it. The question is whether they know it. <laughs> OK. Yes, please, over there. Yeah. The fact that the EU foreign ministers on Monday didn't unanimously support the Paris Declaration, is this for you uh, a fact of Trump or another sign of disunity in the EU? I'll tell you, I, I, from my point of view, this, this, this conference is a not, it's, it's a it's a it's a non-starter for anything. It's a non-starter, so it, it, I cannot make any 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 uh, uh, consequences out of who supported it and who didn't support it. Because, as I said before, it's it's an old it's an old game. The new game starts on Friday, and it's the beginning of a series of new games. France, Germany, and, and the new American policy is going to influence also Britain and other and other. <coughs> In other Western countries, we have to see the relationship between the EU and America. We don't know what the relationship is going to be. No one knows. So therefore, this is, it's out. So it doesn't matter who supported it, who didn't support it, what was there. It looked to me like, uh, like Lucia de la Mamu, which I saw last night. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. But played well. Played well. I don't, I'm not sure. Listen, you see there a president who is leading the whole thing, Olam. Who is lead, you have to go into the website. I went before coming here. I went to the website of the Foreign Ministry of uh, of uh, the, the French Foreign Foreign Office. Now, most of the foreign offices are not so. I will put it in a very uh, a British understatement. Not so pro-Israel. <laughs> okay, most of them, even the Italian one. Were ambassador. Where was ambassador? I, I forgot to mention it was ambassador mm -hmm. in, in Rome. It's not the pro so much. So what is it giving us? It's giving it's giving them nothing. It's putting them in a bad position, in a bad in a bad light, let's put it this way. This will be another conference. Yes, please. How do you see the position of Russia today and in, with the next administration? Uh... This is the $64,000. <laughs> I know one thing. Putin is strong because Obama was weak. In foreign policy, there is no vacuum. And Putin went into the vacuum, which Obama left. Russia is almost, look, there are two leaders the same type. I don't want to talk about my leader. It's Erdogan and, uh, Erdogan and, uh, and uh, Putin. One is coming from a democracy, from a real democracy, which is Erdogan. Russia... A real democracy? It's a democracy. It was not a real democracy until now. No, no, no. I'm just uh, I'm, until until Erdogan, it was not a democracy. Yeah, until until, until yeah. I'm saying, so, so it comes from a tradition. It, there is a tradition of there is a tradition. Let's put it this: there is a tradition of democracy. I'm not talking about Erdogan's era. Putin is coming from a place where there was no democratic uh, uh, democracy. Obama is trying to change the whole world and making it out of uh, one democracy. This is what he tried to do with, with Mubarak. The behavior of Obama vis-a-vis -vis Mubarak was, uh, was unbelievable. Ben Kaspit, who is uh, one of Israel's main writers, after the Obama intervention with Mubarak, wrote an article. And he compared the, the, the wish for democracy by the American administration as somebody who goes to the hospital and needs a heart transplant. And he comes to the hospital. He gets a new heart. First month it works. First month it works. Second month it doesn't. It works. After six months, the heart is not working. It starts problem because the doctor forgot to change the blood. And this is what he compared when you come to put a democracy in a place where there is no democratic tradition. 
Russia has no democratic tradition. So he's going back, taking back the, Soviet, the, the, the Russia to the former Soviet Union. In no time, if the international community will let him, if, if, if the relationship will be by, by, uh, by Trump, like he describes it in his campaign, you will see Putin also taking, taking control of other former Soviet Union. Well, it started with the Ukraine. It started with Ukraine, and who, is, and, who is, and, and, who, and who is next? So this is because the West is weak. And it's not the West is weak, America is weak. A weak America is a bad, bad, uh, bad news for the Western world, for the democratic world. Now, I heard yesterday the statement of, uh, of uh, it's, it's running all the Israeli and American televisions that America, he's going to be the best president, I'm going to be the best president, America is going to be great again. Let's see. I'm, I'm, I don't want to say that I'm skeptical. I'm waiting patiently with everyone here to see how the new administration will behave. It will have also a huge implication on how Russia, on how Russia will, uh, will react to it. I don't see this as a honeymoon between Russia and America. I can't. It's not. In the, it's, it's not. It's not in the cards because of the because of the because of the American system. At le- the checks and balances are still working, and also the support for for Trump in the in the Republican Party is not as strong based on the campaign. So we have to wait and see. And the Russia-Israel relationship. Look, I see, I, first of all, the, the relationship between Russia and Israel is, is not a bad relationship. One reason is the one million Russian Jews who live here in this country, and uh, they, there is a Russian interest to, uh, to, to, to keep them uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the to keep them happy and to, to, uh, and to, to, and to keep, and, and therefore to have a good relationship with Israel because of his community here. And secondly, it's not only community. Countries works on interest. Obama, Obama, uh, Putin wants to be a player. He wants to be a strong player in the Middle East. You cannot be a strong player if you are an enemy of one of the 50% of the conflict. And therefore, he will play his game. Can Israel rely uh, on Russia as a strategic ally like we do on America? The answer is, in my view, no. I have a quick question before we turn to you. Uh, if he makes you know, this uh, promise to move the embassy to Jerusalem, what will be the ramifications, in your opinion? <laughs> I, have an opi- I, have, I have an opinion. <coughs> You're not short of opinions. No, I'm not. Absolutely not. I'm afraid of this move. Why is that? I'm afraid of this move because <coughs> Jerusalem is it's like, like a big barrel of explosive. You need only one one uh, one uh, one uh, match. Uh, match. match in order to fire it, and I don't think I don't think that the Muslim world, the Arab world, will stand still because it's symbolic. <coughs> it's not an embassy. It's not the embassy of uh, of uh, Ukraine or or any other embassy who is moving to to Jer- of San Salvador or Costa Rica, New Zealand, who, New Zealand who is moving to Jerusalem. It's the embassy of the United States of America. It's very symbolic. If you ask me if it will happen, I doubt it. Yes, please. Um, uh, I also have a question, but beforehand, I would like to clarify something uh, briefly. I worked for Yuban Rafa when it started in November 2005. At the time, I was working for the Spanish government. I was second for? for the Spanish government, uh-huh. and I was sent here together with police officers, I'm a civilian, but together with police officers from France, Germany, Spain, you know, all the European countries. And uh, the problem we had was that our mandate was very limited. We had no executive mandate. We were only at the crossing, not along the Philadelphia corridor. We were not there to prevent weapon smuggling. That was not our duty. We were there just to control the people. And in this control of the citizens who were crossing, uh, look, we didn't have the lists of the Shabbat, we didn't have the list of the Palestinian Muhammadan. We were, to some extent, blind. The Israeli Shabbat was looking through the cameras. They had real-time live feed of what was going on at the terminal. But we were there, to some extent, as puppets. And I mean, we were put as puppets. From 
the agreement on movement and access on November the 15th, 2005. So I think it is unfair to criticize the EU because we were, you know, handcuffed and blind from the very mm -hmm. Having said that, <laughs> oh, he agrees. He... My 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 question uh, is that okay. I understand that the Paris Conference was wrong from the timing, from the content, from the format. But you know, how can the international community help, and how can the EU help to support the process? What is the way forward? Is it the let's say meeting, bilateral meeting between? the Prime Minister of Israel and the President of the PA, uh, isolated from everybody else? Is it in Moscow as Putin has offered <coughs> because now he's like the strong guy in the region? Is it in Cairo because Abdel Fattah has you know, a very good approach to Israel and he can be considered friends of Israel? You know, how can we move forward? There is no doubt that pressure is needed on both sides, on both sides, on one thing, to put them together in the same room and to facilitate the talks. But I don't see any international force today who has the leverage to take the Palestinian leadership. And what is the Palestinian leadership? I don't know what the Palestinian leadership is today. I know there's Abu Mazen, who is not very young, not elected, 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 but not re-elected. Re okay, I know this Hamas who talks on behalf of the Palestinians. I know who talks about on behalf of Israel. You like it, you dislike it. We have a prime minister who was democratically elected. I don't know who the who the leader can, who is the leader who can deliver. We need a leader who can deliver. Barbuti. I don't know. It's not my decision, it's not your decision, it's their no, decision. No, this is what Khalil Shkaki okay. told us, this is what the Palestinians... Oh, by election, if they will elect him, okay, he's in, right now he's in prison, we remember. But, but if they will elect him... We're used to people who are elected and go to prison, <laughs> but not uh, the other way around. Why should they have what do we get? We're going to get back to it. Uh, so what I want to say is pressure is being needed. Not an imposed, not an imposed solution. No one can impose a solution. But you need a strong power. And there's only one strong power can do it. The United States of America. Because we are dependent on them. They are, the, the Palestinians are dependent on that. And therefore, they are the only ones who have the power. Now the question is who is going to be the president? No, who is going to be the president? We know. The question is what kind of a president is going to be in the White House? It's not enough to be pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian. You have to be pro-peace. You have to make sure that the both parties will sit down and will understand that if white uh, uh, smoke is not coming out of the room, there's going to be, there are going to be consequences by the international community. This is not the Paris conference. Again, this is a declarative conference. But Trump, Clint, is, so, now, Clint, Clint, Trump, Trump is now sending his uh, son-in-law to fix uh, everything. Maybe he's, you know what, maybe he will have the power over Israel and the Palestinians. Who know? You know? I don't know. You know it and I know it, the question is whether they know it. I don't know. I don't know. It's too early to say. Last one, uh, I, I two, 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 two answers. I need a short one and a longer one. The short one is uh, indicated right at the beginning is that uh, a, a question is Trump tied to the signature of Obama for six months with the moving of the uh, of the uh, that's one question. Uh, that's yeah. the first one. And no, the no. second, the second one is that you left me high and dry with your early answer. Uh, because you said at the beginning that you represent yourself and your wife. Now, I'm interested in... in your wife. My wife. wife. <laughs> she doesn't want me, I'm too old. <laughs> I, I'm also not so young, so listen. I, I, want, I, want, I want to know what do you believe is the government's position 
if the demilitarization fails. Not yours. What do you think will win? I, I think that on this I represent quite closely what the Israeli government will think. I mean, I don't see any Israeli government, if there is an agreement, a two-state solution, and there is a demilitarized uh, Palestinian state, and something happens, I don't see any Israeli government, any Israeli government, left, right, center, Lapid, Herzog, Bibi, no matter who, they will interfere. Of course, it's part of, it's, we have to rely on our forces. This is the reason we need a strong IDF. The, the Oslo process was also... Wait, 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 not finished. And the short answer to the question uh, of the uh, signatures about uh, the, the embassy move, is I, he tied by that? I is that know, the, or can he change it? He has to I consult with I, his wife. I don't know. <laughs> can he change it or I is a signature by the previous I, I don't, president? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Look, the president of the United States is a strong person, a strong position. Okay, I, you asked, asked me about yes. Also today, Israel. Also today, Israel is going to the A areas if it's necessary, Nablus and other places. So even though there are there are the Oslo agreements, when there's a necessity to fight terrorism, Israel is going after the terrorists also in the A area. So why will there be a change when there will be a Palestinian state? I mean, if there will be peace, there is no necessity for us to go in. But if there will be a uh, an event that is going to endanger the security of the people of Israel, any responsible Israeli government will go in. We don't. We have two rules here. A is we finish after one hour of Saturday, and we, I applaud you for uh, keeping uh, uh, staying in time. Second one, we judge if the speaker earned it, uh, we give him a uh, membership card of our uh, ah, president. Okay. And you did, I think, by consensus here, right? <laughs> okay, so Good time to do it. thank you. Good time to do it.